Good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many people interested in entrepreneurship. I'm going to do something unusual. I couldn't decide what I should talk about. I love energy, but I also love entrepreneurship. So I decided I'd ask you what you wanted to hear about. So I'm not going to ask for an informal show of hands and these lights shine in my eyes so I can't see. Uh, but I'm going to ask you what you want to hear about. You either get to hear about energy and my thesis of radical energy innovations and how the world really works. It's sort of a funny presentation because I uh, sort of take the view that all the experts that you believe in and hear about are wrong. Um, and, or we can talk about entrepreneurship. So for those of you who want to hear about energy, please raise your hands. Ooh, a lot of hands. How many people want to hear about entrepreneurship? Uh, you can only vote once. <laughs> OK, energy wins. Energy wins. OK. So can we bring up the first slide, please? So let me talk about energy. The thing with energy is we have a problem that's much worse than we think. And in my view, we have solutions, mostly because of technologists like many of you in the audience, that is much better than we think. And we have this intersection of a much worse energy picture and a much better energy possibility. So what is the energy problem? Forgetting all those expert forecasts that say oil use will grow so much or electricity uh, use will go so fast, look at the simple fact. About 500 million people on this planet, mostly rich people, have an energy-rich lifestyle, mostly in the Western world. At least 5 billion people on this planet want an energy-rich lifestyle. That's a 10x at least. And by the time we are done, it might be a 20x more need for everything. More oil, more electricity, more steel, more cement, no matter what you think about it. That's why almost all those expert forecasts are wrong about how much energy we need. We need a lot more than people think. Now, experts are usually right till there's any change. Uh, I'm a capitalist, so I hate to quote Karl Marx, but he was right. When the train of history hits a curve, the intellectuals fall off. So the first thing I'm going to try and convince you, the thing that most gets in the way of solving the energy problem is this whole notion of what the experts tell you is possible and not. So first, I'm going to tell you to ignore all the experts and prove to you that they're wrong and then go about talking about how we might solve the problem. Two of my favorite quotes, one by Martin Luther King, that human salvation lies in the hands of the creat creatively maladjusted. And George Bernard Shaw, who said, all progress depends on the unreasonable man, or woman, he should have said. Um, he wasn't politically correct. Uh, I think this is essentially true, and this is why all of traditional wisdom on energy is wrong. So let's do a reality check on these experts. The president of the Royal Society, only a few years before the Wright brothers flew the first plane, said that heavier-than-air flying machines are impossible. This was a Western Union memo on the telephone.
This was my favorite because Ken Olson was competing with Sun when we started Sun. He said, why does anybody need a computer of their own? I actually agreed with them that most people don't need a computer, they'd need 20 of them. Your washing machine has a computer that looks like one of DEC, DEC's computers. So, let me ask a question. This was a New York Times article, I think it was uh, fairly recent, a few months ago. And it said that twice as many people in India, 650 million people, have access to cell phones. Twice as many as have access to toilets or latrines. Which expert 10 years ago would have made that forecast? You'd have been thought crazy, but in fact, it's the truth. Why? Because you can go out in the field, but you can't find a substitute to a cell phone. Experts believe conventional wisdom. A tweet. This did not exist five years ago. 100 million users, 65 million tweets a day, and you can tell the mood of the nation. I know people who study the language of tweets and say that people are getting pessimistic or optimistic about the US economy. Who would have forecast that? This is a very interesting map. This is a map, and I won't go into the details in the interest of time, of the number of tweets from Tahir Square when the Egyptian revolution was happening. A few minutes before, you see those isolated tweets near the center. Mubarak announced he was resigning. And then you see it catch fire when Mubarak resigned. Who would have predicted these kinds of tools and the power of these kinds of tools? Only unreasonable people predict these kinds of things, whether it's toilets in India relative to cell phones or whether Twitter can cause or help a revolution. Now, expert forecast is my other favorite thing. My personal view is the only way experts make the right forecast is by, by making lots of them, and then hope that at least one of them will be successful. Let me go prove that. This is the price of oil by the Energy Information Administration August body of the US government, the best experts in econometrics. This was forecast for the price of oil, and I know you can't see the numbers, but the graphs, um, the, the, the picture is what's more important, was the five-year forecast for the price of oil in 1985. The actual price was much, much lower. At the same time, they made a 10-year forecast saying the price of oil would go up by 1995, this was in 1985, the actual price was even lower. So forget the price, price change, they couldn't even get the direction of the change right. Now if you think it happened once, this is what happened in 1990, they couldn't get the direction right, let alone the price, in 1995 and the year 2000. I didn't put the 2010 actuals on, but it was way off this chart, it'd go off that screen. This kind of accuracy, which is completely random, is what we base most energy policy in this country, because these are the experts at the Energy Information Administration who testify before Congress, feed into econometric models. This was the forecast for wind in 2005 year projected deployment, 2006, 2007. You get the point. The actual was that big vertical line. So every year, a lot more wind was deployed than the experts forecast, so they took a new median, a new baseline, and they flattened it out because their models said it was going to be flat and slow growing. This is how forecasts are done. This was my favorite. McKinsey, in the year 1986, 
made a forecast for the year 2000 for AT&T, charged millions of dollars for this study to tell them how many cell phones there would be in the United States by the year 2000, 14 years out. They forecast just under 1 million phones. The actual number of phones was 109 million. So I asked myself, first, why AT&T would pay millions of dollars for a forecast that was off by 10,000%. But more importantly, why did this happen? This was the cell phone in 1986. I owned one of these. Most people, most young people haven't seen these. They were mounted on the floorboard of your car. And the phone cord, yes, cell phones in the year 1986 did have phone cords. The cord was bigger than the cell phone of nine, in the year 2000. Now, if you use the phone on the left to make a forecast of what, how many cell phones there would be, you couldn't forecast 109 million phones. If you couldn't project what technology was going to be like in the year 2000, how could you project the number of cell phones? They took the past and extrapolated it, and I'll come back to this. So which McKinsey analysts could have predicted Twitter, India's cell phone to toilet ratio, all the changes in pharmaceuticals, computers, telecom, media, China's rise, the rise of the fall of the Berlin Wall, Egypt, you take your favorite topic. Now, these are stories, and I don't like stories that aren't scientifically backed up. Um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. Um, I can come back to why these forecasts are wrong. But let's look at this chart. This chart in red is China's per capita income plotted against the per capita consumption of oil in China, that little red thing. The orange thing on the top is the US. And on the bottom axis is per capita income, PPP, for those of you who want to be very accurate. Um, now, you'd think China's oil consumption will keep growing. Yes, it will. Actually, uh, let me point out one thing. In blue and in uh, purple are the oil consumption per capita for Korea and Japan. Now, this is what the US Energy Information Administration and every world body uses to predict oil consumption in China by year. If you assume that China doesn't follow the global model, China follows the a Korea model. That means with income, oil consumption goes up the way it did in Korea. That would be China's oil consumption. If you say China follows Japan's model, that would be China's oil consumption. So just the consumption in China could be off by four or 500 percent based on the model you use. My point is the following. When you see these models and these experts, they take the past, just like the McKinsey guys did, and extrapolate it into the future. So that's not a good thing. Buried in that are assumptions. The US assumed this particular forecast, the one we operate on, assumed China's consumption would grow with GDP the same way the global economy grows. It's more likely to grow the way South Korea grew or Japan grew. So Professor Tetlock at UC Berkeley took 250 experts, followed them for 20 years, and tracked 80,000 expert forecasts. These are the guys you hear on CNBC or the experts that testify before Congress. The average accuracy of 80,000 forecasts and this was rigorous statistical analysis, about the same as dart throwing monkeys. <laughs> now, this is not an exaggeration. This is rigorous statistical data. So hopefully, um, 
I've convinced you to stop paying attention to all the experts. I do. I don't pay any attention to what they tell me is possible, not possible, what the world will be like. I'm going to skip in the interest of time. I'm running a little bit behind. Uh, same thing happened. Experts were asked about the monetary union, the Soviet Union, South Africa, five years before things happened. No relationship between experience and accuracy. I could give you, I could talk for three hours about expert forecast, but we don't have time. The important thing to realize is there's a difference between knowing and the illusion of knowing, which is what experts create. They create this illusion that we know because they have a computer model, an econometric model behind it. So if extrapolation of the past doesn't work, what does? What works is inventing the future. What I tell people is almost certainly if you invent the future you want, you'll have the right forecast. Alan Kay said this a long time ago, and I just repeat his forecast. So, what does happen? This is my, uh, my, my thesis on where social transformation, energy transformation, internet transformation happens. Most large companies view of in innovation, and this is the probability of a technology succeeding on the vertical axis and chance of disruptive impact on the horizontal axis. Most large companies stay on the left where there are high probability of success. My thesis is black swans, the stuff, the improbable causes most of the large social changes. 15 years ago, 1995, every major telecom company told me in this country they would never, quote, never adopt internet protocols or TCP IP for the public telecommunications network. Never. Five years later, companies like AT&T that didn't adopt that technology were going under. Top 10 US most profitable companies going bankrupt. Most people forget AT&T was sold for a song to Singular, and only the brand remains. Improbable, I submit, is not unimportant. One risky shot may be improbable, may fail. Since the Sharks won last night, I like the analogy of shots on goal. More shots on goal. If you have enough shots on goal, you will win. So almost certainly the winning thing, whether it's a technology, will be some improbable. Almost certainly, the safer incremental bets will not work. And this is what is almost impossible to model. So what's a black swan? An event that's rare, extreme impact, and retrospective, though no, not prospective predictability. So let me ponder a lot of improbables. What if oil was 100% renewable and that renewable oil was cheaper than fossil oil? It was cheaper than deep offshore drilling and it was cheaper than oil sands. And if we could, to get to the same place, we use 50% less of it. Almost every expert tells me it's impossible I say it's almost a certainty. Here is one little company. It takes a million years of crude production cycle and reduces it to minutes in a market competitive way. And I'm not saying anything I haven't said for nine months or a year that isn't in the public domain. There's half a dozen companies and I could substitute that name with six other names. There's half a dozen companies that'll be competitive with $100 oil within the next two or three years. 
Loyal will have a hard time competing, and I will go on the record saying, by the year 2030, the price of oil, because of some companies, some technology, probably not cure because every technology gets obsoleted. By 2030, we'll have a set of technologies where the price of oil will be determined by the marginal rent on land. And I suspect in 2006 dollars, and I said this in 2006, the price of oil will be $30 a barrel. Why? Because of companies like this. It's an engine that delivers 50% more efficiency. I have no doubt, and a few months ago, Navistar announced that they would move all their truck engines to this architecture. I have no doubt by 2030, we'll be way above 100% more efficient. 100% more efficient means half the amount of oil. So between producing renewable oil from half a dozen companies and a half a dozen engine companies, they'll cut the consumption in half or a third or who knows how much lower by 2030 or even 2015 in my view or 2020, you're gonna see a dramatic change in the picture for oil. Remember, we are looking for that 10x for 50 million, 500 million people uh, to go to 5 billion. So what if coal-based electricity could be 75% cleaner and we use 75% less of it? Using 75% less would mean the same electricity would go four times further or serve four times as many people if you could achieve that. And we can do a lot better than 75% less electricity to light this bulb or to air condition this room. But what if coal-based electricity could be 75% cleaner? Let me talk about an unusual idea. We all know coal is dirty, coal, coal has all kinds of crap in it, it produces carbon dioxide, not only that, it, it has lots of mercury which goes in the air around coal plants. It has thorium and radioactivity. Most people don't understand the average coal plant puts out more radioactivity than the, the three mile nuclear accident did. Because of radioactive materials in coal, when they burn, they go up in the flue gases. So Cirrus, which is a little company in Denver, decided they'd do clean coal differently while everybody talks about carbon sequestration in underground reservoirs, they said, hey, we know bugs, little microbes, that turn coal into natural gas, and coal bed methane um, is, is, is a well-known phenomenon. In fact, that's why you hear the phrase canary in the coal mine. If a canary, you put a canary in a coal mine, the bugs that convert coal to natural gas create methane in there and kills the canary before it kills the human beings. That's where that term came from. So they said, we'll just feed those bugs that are already down there, they're natural, more nutrients so they turn coal into natural gas and never bring it up. So coal mining without ever bringing up coal to the surface, turn it into natural gas and mine the natural gas. Makes for a much cleaner coal. Then there's cholera, which then turns whatever little carbon dioxide is potentially into cement and building materials. We kill two birds with one stone, we sequester the carbon dioxide, and we produce cement. Came from the insight that the concrete on this floor is mostly carbonates, it's calcium carbonate. Carbonates are CO3, for those of you who are engineers, carbon dioxide is CO2, it seems like a reasonable technical thing to try and attempt. I'm not suggesting all these companies work today. All I'm saying, and you know, we're nowhere near the economics yet to make this happen. But just like those hockey shots, they are shots and goal. And shots and goal, some relatively decent percentage of them will be successful. Sora is another company in Fremont, making lighting 80% more efficient. So you use one-fifth the amount of electricity to produce the same amount of light. But here's the more important part. 
Sora has one very important goal. Everybody knows how to do an LED. The goal at Sora was to do an LED that pays for itself in the very first year. Then everybody can use it because the economics work. Caton, another company in Fremont, is, for those of you who are engineers, inventing or trying to invent a new thermodynamic cycle, something that hasn't been done in 100 years to do cooling. If they succeed, air conditioning can use 80% less electricity. If everything uses 80% less electricity, we have five times more electricity available. So, uh, you know, we can go, keep going through these examples. I'll go through some of them quickly. If you could store electricity, one of the big problems with electricity is the electricity grid. Right? But the problem is the electricity grid only carries maximum electricity at the one time for those 50 or 100 hours a year when electricity is in peak demand. Rest of the time, you transmit a lot less electricity. But what if you could store that electricity? A light sail, while everybody in the world is trying to build lithium ion batteries, decided that they would build a kind of engine called an isothermal engine and store electricity in compressed air. And in compressed air, air is pretty cheap. It'd be dirt cheap. And anybody could afford it. And you could literally triple the capacity of transmission lines and grid by just storing electricity in compressed air. Now, that's a radical idea. But radical ideas, as I said, is how things will happen. I won't talk about this. This is another unusual approach to batteries. Started by a good, good friend of mine. We've done two or three startups with him called Jigdeep Singh. He did Infinera. He did Lightera, which was sold to Sienna. He's now called, doing this thing that I call a quantum nano thingamajigit. But uh, we're obviously not talking a lot about how we're doing it. So these kinds of things tell me when the experts say, 20 years, lithium ion batteries will be everywhere. I say, unlikely. We'll even see lithium in batteries, at least not traditional. We may see some non-traditional lithium ion batteries. When people say silicon solar cells will be everywhere, I suspect within 10 years, silicon will have zero role to play in solar cells. When people say to me, LEDs we build built on silicon carbide, I say, not a chance. So uh, what else? What are other large global problems for that 10x to get 5 billion people to the lifestyle of 5 million, 500 million people? What about steel? Can steel be twice as strong as steel? The answer is yes. Turns out the nanostructure of steel determines the strength of steel. And steel could be five times stronger than steel if we just had the right nanostructure. What about agriculture? We're investing heavily in agricultural technologies because we can multiply the amount of effective productivity of land by 10x. You know, some people believe the Green Revolution has run out of steam, and it has. But the traditional approach to the Green Revolution has run out of steam of feeding more and more nitrogen to plants. Because we, nitrogen is a problem. But what if you didn't use fertilizer to to grow plants better. You didn't need fertilizer, uh, pesticides. We're working on those. I talked about steel. What if, and most people don't know this, that two-thirds of the land in this country for corn is used to produce high fructose corn syrup or, or to produce feed for animals? Now, it's a shame that most of the corn 
is used for that. Humans consume very little corn. But what if all the sugars could be produced from pine chips or wood chips? In fact, we are doing that. We have an operation going in North Carolina that could replace your corn-based sugars, the high fructose corn syrup you hear about from wood chips. You wouldn't need crops like corn. Um, let me give you another example. Turns out you feed, to produce a kilogram of beef, of edible beef, you need 15,000 liters of water. 15,000 liters of water for one kilogram of beef. You need seven kilograms of corn to produce one kilogram of beef. Converting plant protein into animal protein is highly inefficient. What if you could make plant proteins taste like meat? Then we'd all be happy. Those are just some of the examples. And I want to leave a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to try and finish up quickly here. Normally, and this chart I actually put together in the late 80s, I still use it. This was originally about software. It now applies to clean tech. Um, but starting industries look something like that. Lots of little companies doing their thing, adding up to a decent sized pie. What usually happens is a few of those turn into very large businesses. If you look at software, the green would be Microsoft. There were lots of companies, most failed, but the few that succeeded, succeeded in a really big way. And though most companies lost money, more money was made than lost, if you look at the market, micro, uh, micro, uh, market cap of the software business. If you look at the internet, it looked like that thing on the left before. On the right, the green is Google. 15 years from now, the green in the energy space will be some replacement for Exxon. If you want to understand this issue of forecasting, which I've talked about, I recommend a number of books. The first one on expert political judgment is uh, is a very, very good book, but highly statistical. And Professor Tetlock's, uh, un unless you love statistics, you're going to have a hard time getting through it. But he fundamentally concludes that experts are as good as dart throwing monkeys. <laughs> um, so let me stop there. We have about 10 minutes for questions. So why don't you raise your hand, and uh, I'll try and notice you and answer your questions. Um, you talked about energy. Um, can you talk a little bit about water? What do you think about that? So um, that's a great question. Um, water is as, as large a problem as oil. And some people say it'll be a larger problem than oil. We know a lot of wars have been fought over oil. In fact, if you look at history, more wars have been fought over water and will be fought over water than over oil. Um, I have to say, I've spent a lot of time looking for water solutions. We have an interesting company like Nano H2O. You can do, uh, water is really an energy problem. If you have cheap energy, you can desalinate all the water you want. Unfortunately, we found 20, 30 percent improvements in energy efficiency of desalinating water. It's the one area where I haven't yet seen possible solutions. And so if anybody has one, no matter how crazy, I'm happy to try it. Uh, we've tried some crazy things. Uh, we tried to desalinate water without ever using a membrane. Hope that uh, magically water and salt would separate, but it didn't. Uh, but we're willing to try other crazy things, and if somebody has an idea, we'll be happy to do it. Yes. I've known. Uh, no, you talked about technology. 
Uh, how about the impact of the environment that is around and the social structures? For example, efficiency, what people need jobs, and all the, these things will have an impact on how people adopt the technology. Please comment on that. Um, so let me try and interpret the question a little bit. Uh, the social impact of technology is very important. There's two parts of it. The first is simple. If it's cheap, people buy it. And many of you have heard me talk about something I call the Chindia price. It's not the subsidized price of solar cells or biofuels that's important or electric cars or take your favorite subsidized product. The, the time, and the only time these technologies will scale when they reach unsubsidized market competitiveness, that means they'll work because people in India and China buy them, and that applies to Brazil and Africa and every other developing country, because they're the cheapest way to get that stuff. Now, I'm 100% convinced that most of the technologies I talked about, or some replacement of them, will be the cheapest way. That's why I made a point. We can produce biofuels cheaper than oil, unsubsidized. And unless we do that, and we only invest in things that can reach market competitiveness unsubsidized, it won't work. And we do reach those points. If an LED light is cheaper to burn in the first year than your normal incandescent lamp, then it will work. So that's an absolute requirement for scalability. And everything else, these high expensive green technologies are a toy. They're a niche toy. Sometimes they're useful because they're good starting points, but they are toys. The second impact, uh, and I'll, let me tell you a story. I got interested in biofuels for a very odd reason. In the year 2000, when telecom was at its peak, uh, there was an interview published with the red herring that said, Kosla predicts optical and telecom bubble. I was investing in all these companies, and I said, it's getting crazy. I want to do something different. And I decided to work on poverty. And with my limited imagination, I couldn't think of ways I could really impact poverty. I knew how to make 100 people feel good by giving them computers or giving some village a few computers or make feeding a few kids. But that just made me feel good of what I was doing. But there were like 600 million people behind that in India alone who I couldn't really impact. So I started looking for scalable technologies. I said, if the trillion dollars a year we send into bad countries, countries that finance Osama bin Laden and Hugo Chavez and uh, uh, that guy in Iran, Ahmadinejad, if a trillion dollars could go into rural economies, we'd have a very different world. And so the only way I could see oil money going into rural economies was if oil came from biomass and rural agricultural products. That's why I got interested in biofuels in the year 2000. So that's, that's my sort of secret reason I got so started investing so heavily in biofuels, because I thought it would transform every rural economy. Why don't we move to the next question? Yeah, hi there. Thanks for sharing some of the vision. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, the public policy, how much role it is playing or should play in addition to all the entrepreneurial activities that you're talking about? And what about the oil fines in the US, all the shales and the plans to get the price down through more supply from within the US, less energy independence? Uh, you know, policy always plays an important role. But I have a view that policy is hard to influence to do the right thing. Because one of the problems with policy is it's not dynamic. If you're an entrepreneur, and many of you are, most, most of you maybe, you see something wrong three months later, you change your plan. You change what you're doing that quickly. In policy, once a law goes into place, it stays for a long, long time. Most security is regulation. 
is still dependent on the Securities Act of 1933. When policy is so static, it's hard for it to keep up with technology. So as much as policy will help, I don't rely on policy. None of our companies, maybe the one or two companies out of our large portfolio, depend on policy. Most of the time, we are policy independent. We take the view that if the right policy comes, and we try and make it happen, it'll help and accelerate. But if you reach unsubsidized market competitiveness, you don't need policy. People will buy the cheapest stuff, the cheapest energy, because it's the cheapest. And so whether we get the right policy or not, technology will solve the problem, in my view. If we get the right policy, it'll happen faster. If we get the wrong policy, it'll happen slower. Next. Great to see you twice in a week. Uh, um, we might not be able to get through all the questions, but I'll try and be real quick. Your thoughts at MIT got everybody beating their shoes on the floor. <laughs> the question is, you touched upon a few things. My thought would be to plug into your thoughts on if you take the water shortage that we are seeing in the world mm -hmm. and the food shortage that we are seeing in the world and the desires of everybody to get to a lifestyle that we call acceptable standard of living, how do we create enough caloric value of food stock for human being? Yeah. So let me be quick. Let me be real quick. That's linear thinking because people think we have to produce food the way we think we have to and we have to produce water. Let me give you a simple suggestion. There's a class of plants called halophytes. Uh, any biologists here? Uh, I don't see any hands. Halophytes toler are tolerant of salt water, of saltiness. Um, if you did that, you solved both problems. There's plenty of uh, uh, salty water that can uh, grow plants if the plants were tolerant. In fact, we are even looking at bugs that make plants more resistant to salinity. Not saying it's possible today, but in 20, 30 years, if we worked on it, absolutely. Next question. Go ahead, and I'll repeat the question. Okay, I'm told this has to be the last question. I apologize. Thank you for that. All right, my question is, um, I'm passionate about education. So you, what do you think is the future of education and uh, how is technology going to impact that? And two, you talked about uh, agriculture and... Uh, so let's keep it very short because we are out of time. Okay. Yeah. Let me education. answer your education question. Future, the yeah. question is, what do I see about the future of education? We can improve education. People are trying all kinds of policies. I suspect there'll be a black swan in education. So instead of improving classrooms and teachers, maybe eliminate classrooms and teachers. Huh? That's a radical way to think about it. Um, there, my, my wife works on a nonprofit full-time called CK12, which is working only on education. It's a nonprofit effort. But I have um, some ideas how that might eventually evolve. First, you have to get into the system, and then you have to infiltrate and explode the system. I think that's possible. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time. Thank you, everybody.